Thank you very much. Okay, well, what a, what a huge subject to try and talk about in half a day. I, I usually speak at three-day conferences which focus purely on emerging technology in developing countries, and Africa in particular. So trying to cover this in, in 10 minutes is pretty much impossible. What I'll try and do is spend half talking about the leapfrogging technology bit and then half talking about the community bit, and it will be very, very quick. Um, I come here wearing a technology, a development, a conservation, and an anthropology hat, so lots of different hats. And I've not really worked in cities that much. I tend to spend my time working with rural communities in developing countries. Uh, I first went to Africa in 1993, and since then I've spent a lot of time living and working with grassroots nonprofits, trying to understand what life is like for people who are trying to live on $2 a day, and what nonprofits can do in these places to make these people's lives better. When I first started traveling the continent, this was kind of what you saw when you were lucky. Sometimes these phone boxes were actually put in straight, but they were largely all kind of bent over the place, and sometimes they even worked. Right? People would queue for, for hours to make a phone call or go travel for a day or two to make a phone call, and when they got there, the phone may not be working or there might be a huge queue, and the person they're calling might not be at the phone box at the other end. It was really, really difficult to get anything done. And of course, since then, we've seen a huge change in how people communicate and get stuff done with the introduction of mobile phones. Um, I've spent the last 10 years now, 10 years in January next year, trying to understand how we can use mobile phones in particular to help grassroots nonprofits and communities, vulnerable communities in developing countries to get the information they need, to carry out the communication they need, to try and empower them and help them help themselves to get themselves out of the situations that they're in. Development's been going on for decades, and, and although there have been successes, development spends a huge amount of money coming from the outside, trying to plant, transplant outside solutions into places, and it doesn't always or doesn't often work. And what we're seeing with technology is this renaissance of grassroots technology innovation, particularly in East Africa, which is really driving for the first time development from within. We're really living in an amazingly exciting time if we think about developing countries and mobile technology in particular. We spoke earlier about mobile banking very briefly. Around about now or maybe early next year, 50% of Kenya's GDP will go through their mobile banking system. I mean, we don't have anything like that anywhere close to that in the UK or many other developed countries because we're hamstrung by banks in every, every town, by cash machines on every corner. We don't really have a need for that, so we just haven't really gone that route. But there's some really amazing things happening in these places where they're certainly streets ahead of where we are, and um, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, my work over the last seven years has been based on this platform I developed in 2005 called Frontline SMS, and it came out of the work I was doing with these rural communities, mostly in Africa, who were starting to, starting to get hold of phones. Phones were starting to appear in very, very small numbers. And grassroots nonprofits working in those areas were trying to figure out how they can make best use of those phones to deliver health care, agricultural advice, allow people to report election violations, human rights violations, trafficking, a whole bunch of different things. But nothing existed at the time that really allowed you to do this where there was no internet. Most systems were tailored to the internet and tied to the internet. Front on SMS, as you'll see in the picture, it's a piece of software you install on a low-cost computer, very low-tech solution. By plugging a phone in a cable, it allows you to run a two-way text messaging system which can communicate with anybody's phone via an SMS. Every phone on the planet will do SMS and voice. If you do anything else, you start losing people very, very quickly. So this is a very, very inclusive technology. It's allowed grassroots nonprofits to monitor their own elections and create election monitoring groups that can get local people and in this case, Nigerians, to report fraud in their own election rather than people coming from outside and doing it. It allows communities to run their own human trafficking alert systems where if people believe that someone's tried to traffic them, they can report that, and these communities can manage these systems themselves. They're not managed by international donors or people like me, who, in my view, in many cases, don't really have any right trying to fix those problems because we don't own the problem. We want to give people the technology that they need to fix it themselves. And finally, Drugs that are out of stock in places in East Africa where essential drugs to cure your baby of malaria or diarrhea, which should be available and weren't available, you can get people to crowdsource that. Text in if you can't get the drugs you need, and we'll map it, and we'll go to governments, and we'll say, hey, look, there's a real problem here. We've got to fix this because people are dying. But we need to remember, of course, that vulnerable communities exist in, in our side of the world as well. If we look at what's happening across Europe, and this is demonstrations in Greece around austerity, and Greece is a particularly 
bad example in a sense of you know, really what's happening and what's going wrong out there. We're seeing demonstrations around the world where there's a breakdown of community and a breakdown of sense of worth. People are losing jobs. Local shops are shutting. Local businesses are shutting. People don't know their neighbors anymore. Social structures are breaking down in really, really bad ways. And technology has actually helped some of this to happen, if help is the right word. And even in London last summer, we had the London riots, or last year had the London riots, where not everybody was demonstrating about the fact that they felt they didn't belong in their community. There was a lot of rioting for rioting's sake. But a lot of people decided that this was how they wanted to demonstrate and show their dissatisfaction about how their lives were going in London. And this is what I'm working on now. It's slightly different to developing countries, but it's still incredibly community focused. It's a project called Means of Exchange. And, and I have three questions, which I think have been touched on at various points at this conference. You know, how do we better buffer and protect communities from future shocks? How do we build resilience in so that when things happen far, far away that aren't anybody's fault in a community, that they don't lose their homes and lose their jobs and we see the kind of breakdown that we're seeing across Europe today? How do we find a way of reconnecting those communities to local businesses, local resources, and each other? Local shops closing, people buying strawberries from Spain when there are strawberries grown down the road, people using plumbers from 100 miles away when there's a plumber who lives two doors down, and they don't even know that plumber lives two doors down. We used to know people where we lived, and we don't really seem to have that in many places anymore. And finally, how do we better communicate the message that this stuff can actually come back and we should be trying to foster better relationships and better resource use within local communities. And these are the weapons of choice. Um, there are lots of projects out there, and we've had a couple mentioned today, that encourage people to get involved in things. And there's stuff for bartering and time banking and swapping and, and local currencies. But nothing's really gone to scale. And why hasn't it gone to scale? Well, it's partly because they don't make really good use of the technologies that people have in their hands, this kind of stuff. Um, and also, it doesn't make very good use of games and gamification, thinking laterally about how you get people to do things. Games developers have built brilliant games where people voluntarily go in and spend hours solving a problem which they don't really have to solve, but they do anyway, and they get rewarded in a really, really interesting way. Why can't we apply that to real-world problems? Why can't we reward people in a real-world way and stop them fixing problems that don't exist to fixing problems that do exist? This is Tidy Street in Brighton. Some of you may have come across this. They were trying in the street to get people to lower their carbon emissions, the whole thing around polar bears and penguins and you know that kind of, the kind of greenhouse gas thing. And a lot of people weren't really that interested in half filling their kettle and turning things off standby and doing all the things that we know we should do. So they decided, they got a street artist, they decided to paint the street consumption down the road and put the average for Brighton down the middle and then the aggregated value of what's being consumed in the street on the yellow line. And suddenly it became very visible what the street were using. People that weren't involved started to get involved. And then it also became more about keeping the yellow line below the red line. It became a game, right? The fact that the environment benefited was almost secondary to the fact that it became um, this kind of game for them. Um, very finally, on this bit, uh, we did a cash mob last year in Hackney um, Hackney was promised huge riches from the Olympics. People were going to come in their droves and spend in local shops, and it never, ever happened. And it was a really, really big issue, and it maybe largely got swept under the carpet. We organized a cash mob where people use social media to go to this bookshop and buy a book or spend £10. And here we all are, waving our money really enthusiastically. The shop took 100 and sold 100 books in an hour and a half, took £500. It sold nine books earlier that week, in the whole week. And it sold 100 in the hour and a half. And what was really interesting was that using social media in this really interesting way got people excited about going to this shop. They felt part of a movement, part of something meaningful, the whole social event. And they, um, they really didn't really care that much that they were helping a local shop, but it turned out that they were. So we want to go from this, really, I think, people only being able to feel they can talk about or express their feelings about their frustrations of where they live to more of this kind of thing. And also leaving in Einstein's great words, I think it's a fantastic quote, that not everything that counts can be counted and not that everything that can be counted counts. It's not all about numbers and GDP and percentages. Thank you very much.